Hello, 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 my friends, and welcome to a brand new, oh, a brand new season of Terror Radio Podcast. If this is your first time joining me, then welcome. This is a podcast dedicated in bringing you the best of horror and thriller, old time radio broadcasts, as well as original stories. I am your host, Keith, aka the Radio Show Nerd. And as you could probably tell by the sound of my voice, I am a little bit under the weather and just getting over laryngitis. But as they say, the show must go on. The episode today is entitled For Love of the Short Story. So without further ado, this is Terra Radio. The first radio series highlighted is Black Mass. And it is featuring an adaptation of Ambrose Bierce's short story, The Moonlit Road. And this was first broadcasted on November 11th, 1970. Following that is a treat. I was able to find a rare recording of author Shirley Jackson, known for The Haunted House, The House on Haunted Hill, excuse me, and the infamous short story, The Lottery. I found a recording of her narrating one of her short stories, The Demon Lover, from 1960 on Folkways Records. So, you all know the drill. Sit back, turn down the lights, and listen to The Moonlit Road, followed by Shirley Jackson narrating The Demon Lover. Welcome to the Black Mass. Tonight, a ghost story by Ambrose Bias. Here is The Moonlit Road. You haven't touched your tea, Mr. Stephen. Shall I warm it? Don't fuss, Ellen. Please don't fuss. Sherry, then. No, I have it here. Well, this pillow will be more comfortable. Oh, Ellen, stop. I'm not helpless yet. What you can do is close the terrace window. There's a draft again. Oh, Mr. Stephen, but the window's closed. There's no draft, not from here. Not open? Good I feel. Oh, yes, well... Never mind, then. It's a chill you have, Mr. Stephen. And I'm going to have Billy fetch Dr. Benson. For God's sake, stop, Ellen. Stop it. Get Billy to stoke up the fire, and that's all. Now, let me alone. Yes, sir. No. Not a draft? Well, they'll have the house to themselves now, soon enough. As you can see, I am the most unfortunate of men. I am rich. I am respected and well-educated and, until just recently, of sound health. 
I'm the only child of Joel and Julia Hetman. My father was a well-to-do country gentleman. His wife, my mother, was a beautiful and obedient woman to whom he was passionately attached with what I now can suspect was a jealous and exacting devotion. The details that I can relate hardly add up to a story. Indeed, they could fit together in any number of ways. I've imagined all sorts, with feelings so opposed that they've worn down finally to no feeling at all. Doesn't matter now. It ought never to have mattered. Briefly, then, I was a student at Yale. One day, I received a telegram from my father of such urgency that in compliance with its unexplained demand, I, I left at once for home. Father? Father? Uh, Stephen. Uh, Stephen, uh, this way. Uh... Stephen, it's terrible to have to tell you this way. Well, tell me, for God's sake, what is it? Uh, your mother. It's your mother, Stephen. What's happened? She's ill. Dying. Father, now what's happened? She's dead, Stephen. But how? Murdered. Barbarously murdered. Murdered? Why? About whom? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know anything. I had gone to, to Nashville. I didn't expect to be back before the following afternoon. There, well, there was a complication, and I returned home the same night. It was late, nearly, nearly dawn. I found I had no latchkey. I didn't want to wake the servant, so I walked around to the back. I don't know why the doors are always locked. Um, but to my surprise, the back door was open. It was standing open, as if someone had just used it. Uh, I entered and went upstairs to your mother's room. In the darkness, I stumbled over I'll spare you the details, save to say that she was already dead. Strangulation. But why? Was anything taken from the house? No, nothing. So far as we could see. So what about the servants? Hadn't they heard any sound? No, no, nothing. And the assassin? Is there no trace of him? No, nothing. But those uh, terrible finger marks on her throat... Dear God, that I may forget them. I gave up my studies and remained with my father. He was greatly changed. He had always been of a sedate, taciturn disposition. Now he had fallen into so deep a dejection that nothing could hold his attention. Yet anything could arouse him to a fitful interest... A footfall, a sudden entrance, one might have called it an apprehension. Hey, hey who's there? Who, who is it? It's only me, Father. Oh, oh, come in. Uh, well, don't stand there in the dark that way. Uh, shall we take a walk this evening? No. No, oh, the garden's chilly and I'm tired. I think I'll go to my room directly. I worry about you, Father. Yeah. I know that this whole thing has been terrible for you, but you've become too melancholy. Have you taken to sleepwalking as well? Sleepwalking? Why? Last night, didn't you enter my room? I heard steps along the hall, and then my door opened. <clears throat> Someone stood there in the doorway. I thought it was you, and I called out. When I turned on the light, you'd gone. Got to the door only soon enough to see your door closing down the hall. Wasn't it you, Father? Can you remember? No. 
No, no, it, it wasn't me. It must have been your mother. She worries if you come in. Yes, yes, I, I remember. She got up during the night and then came back. Well, she couldn't have. Stephen, what are you trying to do? Do? Isn't it bad enough for me now? Must you make things worse with your, your fantasies, your, your imagining? Well, it might have been a servant. It must have been Ellen. Uh, she's always doting over you. Well, I only wondered that it... Well, if it wasn't you, it might have been... Uh, what do you mean? Well, I mean that the assassin might have returned, might still be in the house. That, that's nonsense. Uh, nonsense. Why? He's never been found. He's still uh, somewhere. Uh, yes, I suppose. Father, have you told me everything that happened that night? Of course. What else? Why do you ask? Because it doesn't make sense. Mother was adored by everyone. She was the kindest woman who ever walked the earth. No sane creature could possibly want to hurt her. Sane? Well, why do you say sane? Father, did she have a lover? Stephen! Was that it? Uh, Is that who opened the back door that night you came back from uh, Asheville? Are you hiding that from me to save her memory? Oh, no, stop! He might have done it. I could imagine that. Mother loved you. I know that. She was devoted to you. She'd never have been unfaithful. But she was kind to everyone. I can imagine his jealousy. His fury at her refusing him. Stephen, stop this. Well, what did happen? She was murdered. Isn't that enough? Enough? Yes. But is it enough for her? Uh, is she still here in this house? Does she haunt us, searching for her lover or her murderer? Does she blame us, Father? Stephen, let it alone. For God's sake, let it alone. I never saw her, but I was convinced that her ghost walked the house. The terrible cold of the presence of the dead was everywhere. Perhaps he saw her. I could not. But there were moments at night. Stephen. Oh, Stephen. Mother! Stephen. The iciness of the grave. Smell of decay. No, I won't see your cat. But I imagined I saw her face hideous, white with hate, rotting, rotting. No, no, go away. I am not your assassin. I am not your assassin. One night, a few months later, my father and I were returning home from our evening's walk. A full moon was high above the horizon, and the road, save for the black shadows of the bordering trees, was a ghostly white. As we approached the gate of our dwelling, my father suddenly stopped. Uh, uh, he clutched my arm. Uh, father, what's the matter? There. Uh, there, there. What is that? I see nothing, Father. There. There at the gate. Directly ahead. There's there. nothing, Father. Come on now. We'd better go in. No. You're ill. No, go away. Oh, go away. Father, what do you see? No, Julia, no. No. I tried to follow no. him, but for some reason couldn't move from the spot. Go no away. The chill had touched my face. Julia. It was all about me. Julia. I couldn't turn my head. No, no, leave me alone. Leave me alone. When I turned to look for my father, he was gone. And in all the years that have passed, 
No whisper of his fate has reached me. I remained here. My youth of brilliant parts and promise faded. Its lifeblood drained, sifted into the darkness and the silence of this house. Voices seek me out. I hear them not. But only doubt. 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 And emptiness. Drink up. Drink up. Tomorrow. Today. I suppose you'd say I was alive. Alive. And tomorrow. Well, there's no tomorrow. No yesterday. Ah. There's nothing beyond that forest. Those trees. That's all I can remember back to. Forest. Twenty years ago. Came out of a forest, made my way across the country, all the way to this place. Well, that was something. That was something. I didn't even know my name. I, I called myself. I called myself Casper. Casper. Every, everyone wants to know, what's your name? What's your name? In this world, everyone must have a name. It, it prevents confusion, even when it does not establish our identity. Casper prevented confusion and spent 20 years trying to find a, a comfortable way to die. There, there's some small light, though, of a past. I don't believe it. I can't believe it. That's the only thing... That seems like a recollection. Even if it's wrong or confused. The only thing I have of that life. Two scenes that play over and over. First, there, there's a house. A big house. Owned by a prosperous planter. And there's a, there's a woman... Beautiful woman, like a child. And a boy, their son. And he's a vague figure, never clear, usually not there at all. The father loves the wife terribly, but he's tortured by, by a fear that she doesn't belong to him. He, he, he can seem to believe her devotion, her love. And, and, and he's reduced to vulgar and commonplace ways of testing her. Uh, one day, one day, he goes to the city. He tells her, I'll be gone till the next afternoon. But, but I'll come back. I'll come back that night and go to a rear door that I had left unlocked. 
dark all around the house. But, but as I approach, I, I hear something. The door is open. And a figure. A man. I thought it was a man. I, I feared it was a man. Sometimes now I can't even believe it was human. He he headed straight for me, then just disappeared in the dark. I didn't know where to chase him. So intensely did my 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 jealousy and rage fill me. I didn't search. I rushed into the house and up the stairs, up the stairs to her room, and. I pushed open her door. I saw the bed. Vaguely. The covers tossed about. I went to it. Empty. She was gone. Escaped. Or oh, hiding. Hiding. I looked I looked about in the darkness. I walked straight to a corner where she knelt against the wall. I could see her face, the terror in her eyes, the guilt, the guilt. Ah, my hands were at her throat. I, I kneeled on her struggling body, and there, there in the darkness, I strangled, strangled her till she was dead. Dead. Dead! <laughs> Dead! <laughs> no, no, it never happened. It never happened. I don't believe it. Oh, I was possessed. Uh, possessed by something or someone. But it's all I have. It's all that comes from me. I go over it again and again. Now, there's another scene. Another dream. Another vision of the night. I stand among shadows along a moonlit road. Someone is with me. I cannot see who. But there's another presence. Head. Where the road ends at a gate. In the shadow of the large house. I catch the gleam of white garments. Then the figure of a woman. Before me on the road. Her. Her, my wife. Julia. Murdered. Death in the face. Marks. Marks on the throat. Eyes are fixed on man with an, an infinite sadness. Sadness, not hate. Not menace, but the apparition terrifies me. Terrifies me. Still terrifies me. She still reaches out to me here. No. No. Drink up. Drink up. This does it. Wipes it out. Wipes it out. For a little while. For a little while. no use. And it only confuses me why he's so fearful. He doesn't see me. He never saw me. I 
can't imagine what he would see now. But fear has no sense at all. It's crazy. Just crazy. It makes horrible things out of those who want only kindness and some peace. I keep wandering among these scenes, these rooms, in search of something that just doesn't matter anymore, what really happened. No one seems to know. Joel's gone, and there's only Stephen left for a little while. Stephen's my son. He wasn't here at the time. He was away at college. Joel wasn't here either. He'd gone to Nashville on some business and was staying the night. I'd retired early and fallen into a peaceful sleep, but then I awoke. The house seemed more than usually quiet. I had a strange sense of danger, of something. Well, not that I was afraid of being alone. I was often alone, but this was different. There was a chill as one waits for a thing long imagined or feared. And the feeling grew as I lay there. I felt as if I were lying straight and cold in my coffin. The white satin around my head. The smell of dried flowers. A little bouquet I held in my hand. I wanted to pull my fingers apart but couldn't, as in a dream. No. No. I strained for some sign of life in me. And then... Oh. I could feel my heart pounding. It was a dream. I sat up in the dark and listened. My own heart was the only sound at first. I listened and... After a while, I wondered if the beating came from inside me or somewhere else. I tried to hear which. And then as if my own fears had decided, had reached out into the dark house and began to assemble some figure, something. I heard it first on the stairway from the back entrance just below my room. So... Irregular sound of footfalls on the stairs. It was slow, hesitant, uncertain, as of something that did not see its way. To my disordered reason, all the more terrifying for that, as the approach of some blind and mindless malevolence to which there is no appeal. I said that fear has no brains, it's an idiot. But this had a growing purpose. Taken shape as it approached. It approached my door and then stood there. I heard the breath. He hesitated, his hand on the door. Then it, it turned and went away down the stairs hurriedly, as if in sudden fear. I rose to call for help. But hardly had my shaken hand found the door knob when I heard it returning. It ran up the stairs, shaking the house. I fled to a corner of the room and crouched on the floor. I, I tried to cry out. I tried to call Joel, my husband. But suddenly, it was in the room, searching me out. Oh. It had gone to the bed and stopped there and turned and came directly to me. Uh, I felt a strength of clutch upon my throat. I beat feebly against something that bombed backwards. I felt my tongue thrust itself to my And then I passed into this life. No, I have no knowledge of what it was. 
The sum of what we know at death is the measure of what we know afterwards. No new light falls upon any page of it. In memory is written all that we can read. We hide in the dark and peer out into the dim light of the present and the fading past. But there is one more scene. A night. We know when it is night. For then you retire to your houses. And we can venture from our places of concealment to move unafraid about our old home. To look in at the windows even to enter rooms and gaze upon your faces as you sleep. I could see my husband, Joel, and Stephen. How strange they looked. How alone. Had they loved me after all, they were saddened and aged by my departure. I tried so often to make them see me, some way to let them know I was here, and send them my great love and pity. But always if I dared approach, or wake them in their sleep, they would turn toward me the terrible eyes of the living, frightening me. And I would hesitate, as if my hand was now upon the door, and turn away. On this night, I had searched for them, but they were nowhere in the house. I looked about the moonlit lawn, and then moved in the white light along the path to the gate. Suddenly, I saw them on the road. They had stopped walking and were looking toward the house. I heard their voices. They stood in the shadow of a group of trees. They stood near, so near. Their faces were turned toward me. And Joel, Joel's eyes were fixed on mine. He saw me. At last he saw me. All my terror and hesitation was gone. He sees. He sees he will understand. I moved forward, smiling and consciously beautiful, to offer myself to his arms, to comfort him to speak words that would restore the broken bonds between the living and the dead. Joel. 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 No. But his no, face went Joel. white with fear. Julia. No his way. eyes were those of a hunted no animal. Way. Leave me alone. He backed away and ran. No. Ran no, right no into the way. woods. No. He never returned. Maybe he died and wanders about some other place as I do here. And Stephen, poor Stephen, is left even more alone. You haven't touched your teeth. I've never been able to make him know that I'm here, watching him, longing to care for him as a mother should. But soon he too must pass to this life invisible and be lost to me. Lost. Oh, Mr. Stephen, but the window's closed. There's no draft, not That was The Moonlit Road by Ambrose Bierce. The part of Julia was played by Norma Jean Wanvick. Stefan was Martin Punch. Ellen was played by Nancy Punch. And Joel was played by your host of the Black Mass, Eric Bowersfeld. The technical production was by John Whiting. And now, good night.
She had not slept well. From one thirty, when Jamie left and she went lingeringly to bed, until seven, when she at last allowed herself to get up and make coffee, she had slept fitfully, stirring awake to open her eyes and look into the half-darkness, remembering over and over, slipping again into a feverish dream. She spent almost an hour over her coffee, they were to have a real breakfast on the way, and then, unless she wanted to dress early, she had nothing to do. She washed her coffee cup and made the bed, looking carefully over the clothes she planned to wear, worried unnecessarily at the window over whether it would be a fine day. She sat down to read, thought that she might write a letter to her sister instead, and began in her finest handwriting. Dearest Anne, by the time you get this, I will be married. Doesn't it sound funny? I can hardly believe it myself, but when I tell you how it happened, you'll see it's even stranger than that. Sitting, pen in hand, she hesitated over what to say next, read the lines already written, and tore up the letter. She went to the window and saw that it was undeniably a fine day. It occurred to her that perhaps she ought not to wear the blue silk dress. It was too plain, almost severe, and she wanted to be soft and feminine. Anxiously, she pulled through the dresses in the closet, and hesitated over a print she had worn the summer before. It was too young for her, and it had a ruffled neck, and it was very early in the year for a print dress, but still. She hung the two dresses side by side on the outside of the closet door, and opened the glass doors carefully closed upon the small closet that was her kitchenette. She turned on the burner under the coffee pot and went to the window. It was sunny. When the coffee pot began to crackle, she came back and poured herself coffee into a clean cup. I'll have a headache if I don't get some solid food soon, she thought. All this coffee smoking too much, no real breakfast. A headache on her wedding day. She went and got the tin box of aspirin from the bathroom closet and slipped it into her blue pocketbook. She'd have to change to a brown pocketbook if she wore the print dress, and the only brown pocketbook she had was shabby. Helplessly, she stood looking from the blue pocketbook to the print dress and then put the pocketbook down and went and got her coffee and sat down near the window, drinking her coffee and looking carefully around the one-room apartment. They planned to come back here tonight and everything must be correct. With sudden horror, she realized that she had forgotten to put clean sheets on the bed. The laundry was freshly back and she took clean sheets and pillowcases from the top shelf of the closet and stripped the bed, working quickly to avoid thinking consciously of why she was changing the sheets. The bed was a studio bed with a cover to make it look like a couch, and when it was finished, no one would have known that she had just put clean sheets on it. Her coffee was cold when she came back to it, but she drank it anyway. When she looked at the clock, finally, and saw that it was after nine, she began at last to hurry. She dressed carefully, all her underwear fresh, and most of it new. When she was ready for her dress, she hesitated before the closet door. The blue dress was certainly decent, and clean, and fairly becoming. The print dress was overly pretty, and new to Jamie, and yet wearing such a print this early in the year was certainly rushing the season. Finally, she thought, this is my wedding day, I can dress as I please and she took the print dress down from the hanger. When she slipped it on over her head, it felt fresh and light, but when she looked at herself in the mirror, she remembered that the ruffles around the neck did not show her throat to any great advantage, and the wide swinging skirt looked irresistibly made for a girl, for someone who would run freely and dance and swing it with her hips when she walked. Looking at herself in the mirror, she thought with revulsion. It's as though I was trying to make myself look prettier than I am just for him. He'll think I want to look younger because he's marrying me. And she tore the print dress off so quickly that a seam under the arm ripped. In the old blue dress, she felt comfortable and familiar but unexciting. It isn't what you're wearing that matters, she told herself firmly and turned in dismay to the closet to see if there might be anything else. 
there was nothing even remotely suitable for her marrying Jamie. And for a minute she thought of going out quickly to some little shop nearby to get a dress. Then she saw that it was close on ten and she had no time for more than her hair and her makeup. Her hair was easy, pulled back into a knot at the nape of her neck. But her makeup was another delicate balance between looking as well as possible and deceiving as little. She could not try to disguise the sallowness of her skin or the lines around her eyes today, when it might look as though she were only doing it for her wedding. And yet she could not bear the thought of Jamie's bringing to marriage anyone who looked haggard and lined. You're thirty-four years old after all, she told herself cruelly in the bathroom mirror. Thirty, it said on the license. It was two minutes after ten. She was not satisfied with her clothes, her face, her apartment. She heated the coffee again and sat down in the chair by the window. Can't do anything more now, she thought. No sense trying to improve anything the last minute. Reconciled, settled, she tried to think of Jamie and could not see his face clearly or hear his voice. It's always that way with someone you love, she thought, and let her mind slip past today and tomorrow into the farther future, when Jamie was established with his writing and she had given up her job, the golden house in the country future they had been preparing for the last week. I used to be a wonderful cook, she had promised Jamie. With a little time and practice, I could remember how to make angel food cake and fried chicken. Knowing how the words would stay in Jamie's mind half tenderly. And hollandaise sauce, she said. 10.30. She stood up and went purposefully to the phone. She dialed and waited, and the girl's metallic voice said, The time will be exactly 10.29. Half-consciously, she set her clock back a minute. She was remembering her own voice saying last night in the doorway, Ten o'clock, then I'll be ready. Is it really true? And Jamie laughing down the hallway. By eleven o'clock she had sewed up the ripped seam in the print dress and put her sewing box away carefully in the closet. With the print dress on, she was sitting by the window drinking another cup of coffee. I could have taken more time over my dressing after all, she thought, but by now it was so late he might come any minute, and she did not dare try to repair anything without starting all over. There was nothing to eat in the apartment except the food she had carefully stocked up for their life beginning together. The unopened package of bacon, the dozen eggs in their box, the unopened bread and the unopened butter. They were for breakfast tomorrow. She thought of running downstairs to the drugstore for something to eat, leaving a note on the door. Then she decided to wait a little longer. By 11.30 she was so dizzy and weak that she had to go downstairs. If Jamie had had a phone, she would have called him then. Instead, she opened her desk and wrote a note. Jamie have gone downstairs to the drugstore back in five minutes. Her pen leaked down to her fingers, and she went into the bathroom and washed, using a clean towel which she replaced. She tacked the note on the door, surveyed the apartment once more to make sure that everything was perfect, and closed the door without locking it, in case he should come. In the drugstore she found that there was nothing she wanted to eat except more coffee, and she left it half finished, because she suddenly realized that Jamie was probably upstairs waiting and impatient, anxious to get started. But upstairs everything was prepared and quiet as she had left it, her note unread on the door, the air in the apartment a little stale from too many cigarettes. She opened the window and sat down next to it until she realized that she had been asleep and it was twenty minutes to one. Now suddenly she was frightened, waking without preparation into the room of waiting and readiness. Everything clean and untouched since ten o'clock, she was frightened and felt an urgent need to hurry. She got up from the chair and almost ran across the room to the bathroom, 
dashed cold water on her face and used a clean towel. This time she put the towel carelessly back on the rack without changing it. Time enough for that later. Hatless, still in the print dress with a coat thrown on over it, the wrong blue pocketbook with the aspirin inside in her hand. She locked the apartment door behind her, no note this time, and ran down the stairs. She caught a taxi on the corner and gave the driver Jamie's address. It was no distance at all. She could have walked if she had not been so weak. But in the taxi she suddenly realized how imprudent it would be to drive brazenly up to Jamie's door, demanding him. She asked the driver, therefore, to let her off at a corner near Jamie's address, and after paying him, waited until he drove away before she started to walk down the block. She had never been here before. The building was pleasant and old, and Jamie's name was not on any of the mailboxes in the vestibule, nor on the doorbells. She checked the address. It was right. And finally she rang the bell marked superintendent. After a minute or two, the door buzzer rang, and she opened the door and went into the dark hall, where she hesitated until the door at the end opened, and someone said, Yes? She knew at the same moment that she had no idea what to ask, so she moved forward toward the figure waiting against the light of the open doorway. When she was very near, the figure said yes again, and she saw that it was a man in his shirt sleeves, unable to see her any more clearly than she could see him. With sudden courage, she said, I'm trying to get in touch with someone who lives in this building and I can't find the name outside. What's the name you wanted? The man asked, and she realized that she would have to answer. James Harris, she said. Harris. The man was silent for a minute, and then he said, Harris. He turned around to the room inside the lighted doorway and said, Margie, come here a minute. What now? A voice said from inside. And after a wait long enough for someone to get out of a comfortable chair, a woman joined him in the doorway, regarding the dark hall. Lady here, the man said. Lady looking for a guy named of Harris lives here. Anyone in the building? No, the woman said. Her voice sounded amused. No man named Harris here. Sorry, the man said. He started to close the door. You got the wrong house, lady, he said, and added in a lower voice, or the wrong guy. And he and the woman laughed. When the door was almost shut and she was alone in the dark hall, she said to the thin lighted crack still showing, But he does live here, I know it. Look, the woman said, opening the door again a little. It happens all the time. Please don't make any mistake, she said, and her voice was very dignified with 34 years of accumulated pride. I'm afraid you don't understand. What did he look like? The woman said wearily, the door still only part open. He's rather tall and fair. He wears a blue suit very often. He's a writer. No, the woman said, and then, could he have lived on the third floor? Well, I'm not sure. There was a fellow, the woman said reflectively. He wore a blue suit a lot, lived on the third floor for a while. The Roysters lent him their apartment while they were visiting her folks upstate. Well, that might be it. This one wore a blue suit mostly, but I don't know how tall he was, the woman said. He stayed there about a month. Yes, she said, a month ago is when... You ask the Roysters, the woman said. They come back this morning, apartment 3B. The door closed, definitely. The hall was very dark and the stairs looked darker. The apartment doors lined up four on the floor, uncommunicative and silent. There was a bottle of milk outside 2C. On the third floor, she waited for a minute. There was the sound of music behind the door of 3B, and she could hear voices. 
Finally she knocked and knocked again. The door was opened and the music swept out at her, an early afternoon symphony broadcast. How do you do, she said politely to the woman in the doorway, Mrs. Royster? That's right. The woman was wearing a house coat and last night's makeup. I wonder if I might talk to you for a minute. Sure, Mrs. Royster said, not moving. About Mr. Harris. What, Mr. Harris, Mrs. Royster said flatly. Mr. James Harris, the gentleman who borrowed your apartment. Oh, Lord, Mrs. Royster said. She seemed to open her eyes for the first time. What did he do? Nothing. I'm just trying to get in touch with him. Oh, Lord, Mrs. Royster said again. Then she opened the door wider and said, Come in, and then, Ralph! Inside, the apartment was still full of music, and there were suitcases half unpacked on the couch, on the chairs, on the floor. A table in the corner was spread with the remains of a meal, and the young man sitting there for a minute resembling Jamie got up and came across the room. What about it, he said. Mr. Royster, she said. It was difficult to talk against the music. The superintendent downstairs told me that this was where Mr. James Harris has been living. Sure, he said, if that was his name. Well, I thought you lent him the apartment, she said, surprised. Well, I don't know anything about him, Mr. Royster said. He's one of Dottie's friends. Not my friends, Mrs. Royster said, no friend of mine. Why, she asked suddenly. You looking for him? It's very important. I'm sorry he's not here, Mrs. Royster said. She stepped forward politely when she saw her visitor turn toward the door. Maybe the super saw him, Mr. Royster said into the magazine. When the door was closed behind her, the hall was dark again, but the sound of the radio was deadened. She was halfway down the first flight of stairs when the door was opened. And Mrs. Royster shouted down the stairwell, If I see him, I'll tell him you were looking for him. What can I do, she thought out on the street again. It was impossible to go home, not with Jamie somewhere between here and there. She stood on the sidewalk so long that a woman, leaning out of a window across the way, turned and called to someone inside to come and see. Finally, on an impulse, she went into the small delicatessen next door to the apartment house on the side that led to her own apartment. There was a small man reading a newspaper leading against the counter. When she came in, he looked up and came down inside the counter to meet her. I'm trying to get in touch with a man who lived in the apartment house next door, and I just wondered if you knew him. Why don't you ask the people there? The man said, his eyes narrow, inspecting her. It's because I'm not buying anything, she thought. And she said, I'm sorry, I asked them, but they don't know anything about him. They think he left this morning. Well, I don't know what you want me to do, he said, moving a little back toward his newspaper. I'm not here to keep track of guys going in and out next door. She said quickly, I thought you might have noticed, that's all. He would have been coming past here a little before ten o'clock. He was rather tall, and he usually wore a blue suit. Now, how many men in blue suits go past here every day, lady? The man demanded. You think I got nothing else to do? I'm sorry, she said. She heard him say, for God's sake, as she went out the door. As she walked toward the corner, she thought, he must have come this way. It's the way he'd go to get to my house. It's the only way for him to walk. She tried to think of Jamie. Where would he have crossed the street? What sort of person was he actually? Would he cross in front of his own apartment house? At random in the middle of the block? At the corner? On the corner was a newsstand. They might have seen him there. She hurried on and waited while a man bought a paper and a woman asked directions. When the newsstand man looked at her, she said, Can you possibly tell me if a rather tall young man in a blue suit went past here this morning around ten o'clock? When the man only looked at her, his eyes wide and his mouth a little open, she thought, 
he thinks it's a joke or a trick. And she said urgently, it's very important, please believe me, I'm not teasing you. Look, lady, the man began. And she said eagerly, he's a writer, he might have bought magazines here. What do you want him for, the man asked. He looked at her, smiling. And then she realized that there was another man waiting in back of her, and the news dealer's smile included him. Never mind, she said, but the news dealer said, Listen, maybe he did come by here. Now, I don't know for sure, mind you, but there might have been someone like your gentleman friend coming by this morning. About ten? About ten, the news dealer agreed. Tall fellow, blue suit, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Which way did he go, she said eagerly, uptown? Uptown, the news dealer said, nodding. He went uptown, that's just exactly it. Uptown, she thought, that's right. And she started up the avenue, thinking, he wouldn't have to cross the avenue, just go up six blocks and turn down my street, so long as he started uptown. About a block farther on, she passed a florist's shop. There was a wedding display in the window, and she thought, This is my wedding day, after all. He might have gotten flowers to bring me. And she went inside. The florist came out of the back of the shop, smiling and sleek. And she said before he could speak so that he wouldn't have a chance to think she was buying anything. It's terribly important that I get in touch with a gentleman who may have stopped in here to buy flowers this morning. Terribly important. She stopped for breath and the florist said, Yes, what sort of flowers were they? Well, I don't know, she said, surprised. He never... She stopped and said, He was a rather tall young man in a blue suit. It was about ten o'clock. The florist closed his eyes, one finger to his mouth, and thought deeply. Then he shook his head. I simply can't, he said. Thank you, she said despondently, and started for the door. When the florist said in a shrill, excited voice, Wait, wait just a moment, madam. She turned, and the florist, thinking again, said finally, Chrysanthemums. He looked at her inquiringly. Oh, no, she said. Her voice shook a little, and she waited for a minute before she went on. Not for an occasion like this, I'm sure. The florist tightened his lips and looked away coldly. Well, of course, I don't know the occasion, he said, but I'm almost certain that the gentleman you were inquiring for came in this morning and purchased one dozen chrysanthemums. No delivery. You're sure, she asked. Positive, the florist said emphatically. He escorted her to the door. Nice corsage, he said as they went through the shop. Orchids, perhaps? No, thank you, she said. And he said, I hope you find your young man. And gave it a nasty sound. There was a policeman on the corner and she thought, Why don't I go to the police? You go to the police for a missing person, and then thought what a fool I'd look like. She had a quick picture of herself standing in a police station saying, Yes, we were going to be married today, but he didn't come. And the policemen, three or four of them standing around listening, looking at her at the print dress, at her too bright makeup, smiling at one another. She couldn't tell them any more than that, could not say. Yes, it looks silly, doesn't it, me all dressed up and trying to find the young man who promised to marry me. No, the police were obviously impossible. Leaving out Jamie and what he might think when he heard she'd set the police after him. No, no, she said aloud, hurrying her steps, and someone passing stopped and looked after her. On the coming corner, she was three blocks from her own street, was a shoe shine stand, an old man sitting almost asleep in one of the chairs. She stopped in front of him and waited, and after a minute he opened his eyes and smiled at her. Look, she said, the words coming out before she thought of them. I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm looking for a young man who came up this way about ten this morning. Did you see him? 
and she began her description. Tall, blue suit, carrying a bunch of flowers. The old man began to nod before she was finished. I saw him, he said. Friend of yours? Yes, she said and smiled back involuntarily. The old man blinked his eyes and said, I remember I thought, you're going to see your girl, young fellow. They all go to see their girls, he said, and shook his head tolerantly. Which way did he go, straight on up the avenue? That's right, the old man said. Got a shine, had his flowers, all dressed up in an awful hurry. You've got a girl, I thought. For the first time, she was really sure he would be waiting for her. And she hurried up the three blocks, the skirt of the print dress swinging under her coat, and turned into her own block. From the corner, she could not see her own windows, could not see Jamie looking out, waiting for her, and going down the block, she was almost running to get to him. Her key trembled in her fingers at the downstairs door, and as she glanced into the drugstore, she thought of her panic, drinking coffee there this morning and almost laughed. At her own door, she could wait no longer, but began to say, Jamie, I'm here, I was so worried, even before the door was open. Her own apartment was waiting for her, silent, barren, afternoon shadows lengthening from the window. For a minute, she saw only the empty coffee cup, thought, he has been here waiting, before she recognized it as her own left from the morning. She looked all over the room, into the closet, into the bathroom. The old man at the shoe shine stand woke up again to see her standing in front of him. Hello again, he said, and smiled. Are you sure, she demanded. Did he go on up the avenue? I watched him, the old man said, dignified against her tone. I thought... There's a young man's got a girl. And I watched him right into the house. What house? She said remotely. Right there, the old man said. He leaned forward to point. Which one, she said. About the middle of the block, the old man said. She almost ran without stopping to say thank you. Up on the next block, she walked quickly searching the houses from the outside to see if Jamie looked from a window, listening to hear his laughter somewhere inside. A woman was sitting in front of one of the houses, pushing a baby carriage monotonously back and forth the length of her arm. The baby inside slept, moving back and forth. The question was fluent by now. I'm sorry, but did you see a young man go into one of these houses about ten this morning? He was tall, wearing a blue suit, carrying a bunch of flowers. A boy about twelve stopped to listen, turning intently from one to the other, occasionally glancing at the baby. Big bunch of flowers? The boy asked, pulling at her coat. Big bunch of flowers? I seen him, missus. She looked down and the boy grinned insolently at her. Which house did he go in? Listen, the boy said, I seen him, he went in there. He pointed to the house next door. I followed him, the boy said. He gave me a quarter. The boy dropped his voice to a growl and said, This is a big day for me, kid, he says. Give me a quarter. Was he carrying flowers? Yeah, the boy said. The street door of the apartment house was unlocked. There were no bells in the outer vestibule and no lists of names. The stairs were narrow and dirty. There were two doors on the top floor. The front one was the right one. There was a crumpled florist's paper on the floor outside the door, and a knotted paper ribbon like a clue, like the final clue in the paper chase. She knocked and thought she heard voices inside, and she thought suddenly with terror, what shall I say if Jamie is there if he comes to the door? The voices seemed suddenly still, she knocked again, and there was silence, except for something that might have been laughter far away. She waited and knocked again, but there was silence. Finally, she went to the other door on the floor and knocked. 
The door swung open beneath her hand, and she saw the empty attic room, bare lathe on the walls, floorboards unpainted. She stepped just inside, looking around. The room was filled with bags of plaster, piles of old newspapers, a broken trunk. There was a noise which she suddenly realized as a rat, and then she saw it, sitting very close to her near the wall, its evil face alert, bright eyes watching her. She stumbled in her haste to be out with the door closed, and the skirt of the print dress caught and tore. She knew there was someone inside the other apartment, because she was sure she could hear low voices, and sometimes laughter. She came back many times, every day for the first week. She came on her way to work, in the mornings, in the evenings on her way to dinner alone. But no matter how often or how firmly she knocked, no one ever came to the door. Well, that's our show for today. I want to thank you all for listening. And remember, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash terror 1970. Or you can find me on Instagram at radio show nerd. I also have a YouTube channel, Terror Radio. Please check it out. Subscribe. Like and share the videos. It will be highly appreciated. Again, this is your host, Wolfman Jack, better known as Keith, better known as the radio show nerd, (laughs) signing off.